But let's move away from this situation to another one that we're dealing with, which is the Supreme Court judgment on the old 200, 500, and 1,000 Naira being legal tenders until 31st of December 2023. The Supreme Court delivered judgment on the suit filed by some state governments to challenge the federal court government's Naira redesign policy. The controversial monetary policy being challenged at the Supreme Court had last year introduced newly redesigned 200, 500, and 1,000 Naira notes with tight deadline to mop up the old notes from circulation. The policy has led to scarcity of currency notes bringing untold hardship to millions of citizens in an economy significantly driven by informal sector with a large proportion of unbanked persons. Well, the question is, why, why do we continue to have narrow scarcity despite this judgment? Johnson, please come in. This is a question of fact. And, um and if you ask me, I, I will say, now who I will ask? <laughs> <laughs> so, but let us look at it more objectively. Um, currency um, circulation is in the preserve of the Central Bank of Nigeria. So we've just seen a fair a decision by the um, Supreme Court asking the Central Bank to put money into circulation. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it tried to specify for the central bank the type of money it should put into circulation. Uh, it would have even been better if the, central, the Supreme Court has said to the central bank that it should print more um, new currencies and put them into circulation if the objective is to ease off the scarcity of currency in circulation. But what is so peculiar about the old news that it has to remain in circulation? I, I haven't understood it, and that is why um, the judgment of the Supreme Court, much as it is the final decision of the court of the land, which must be complied with by all persons in the territory of Nigeria, it seems that it is difficult to um, obey, because um, we must also accept that um, after a judgment has been made, it will lie in the hands of the executive to implement it just the way it implements other laws. So a situation where a, a judgment looks like it is un, um, incapable of being implemented in the form that it has been pronounced, it will look like the courts have acted in vain. And um, we are asked, or some of the things we are taught in our um, jurisprudence class is, uh, as lawyers is that the court should never act in vain. Okay, please explain so, this to us. Explain this to us because, um, and you are the lawyers here, I need to understand, and I imagine that a lot of our viewers need to understand. When the Supreme Court makes a judgment, mm. must the president, that's executive, come out mm. to tell the people, okay, you can obey this? Or is it given mm. that when the Supreme Court has made a judgment, that Nigerians should just go ahead and begin the to... Authority. The rule is that once the court has made a pronouncement, every authority in the country, every person in the country begins to comply with that of them. Without direct... necessarily waiting for the federal government Nobody to make an announcement. Should... Nobody should wait for anybody because everybody is equal and required to comply with the law. And the, what, is, what the court has just pronounced is interpretation of what the law should be. All right, but what Nigerians are facing right now, which is a major reason for the scarcity of the Naira, even after this judgment, is that you go to some court, uh, some banks, uh, commercial banks, deposit banks, and you'll be told that they're still waiting for directive from the central bank before they start issuing out money. That is why I was saying that the Supreme Court did not consider the implementation of the order it was making before it made it. So it's not just about making orders. You should make orders that are implementable. Now, how is this order going to be implemented? Okay, you said this money is remain legal tender, but in whose office is it to direct the circulation or manage circulation of money? The, the CBN or the president or anybody would, would simply say they have not done anything to prevent circulation of money. They've only uh, 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 regulated how money is circulated. 
I don't know if you get what I'm explaining. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough situation that we have found ourselves in. Maybe I think the, the Supreme Court was just angry that the federal government did not comply with its interim orders and gave this judgment, in my view, with a lot of anger. I'm afraid I might run into contempt of the court, but this is how I see it. I'm criticizing okay. the judgment. All right. Uh, Barry Sal Mooring. Mm. Yes, please. Uh, you know, I, when we started, the judgments of court are obeyed, yes. But also, you, it, it is open for people to analyze and look at the judgment. Whether if, no, if everybody, like um, uh, the lawyer to the, to the federal government said, this, the Supreme Court has spoken, everybody must comply. Yes. But there are issues in this matter that. Uh, that faces me. One of them is this. The judgment of the Supreme Court was one about Central Bank of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Was interpreting the Central Bank Act. Now, the in um, um, of Kuti against Attorney General of the Federation, the Supreme Court stated something very explicit. Since 1978, I mean 77, after the first house was born, that fundamental rights of Nigeria, those rights that are fundamental rights, are superior to all other rights. Once fundamental right is breached, any other thing you do falls on the basis of fundamental rights. Now, the Supreme Court has decided, yes. However, the Supreme Court the Central Bank of Nigeria that is directed to carry out this policy will not be a party before the Supreme Court. The rights of Central Bank of Nigeria, which is a question of a person, have they not been, are those right, is the right to fair hearing of, the, of Central Bank not breached by this decision? Did the Supreme Court hear from the Central Bank of Nigeria? Yes, the Supreme Court may have felt the justices may have felt, oh, the president has, was thumbing his nose at them. Yes, but in matters like this, and how did the Supreme Court arrive at December 31st? Policies are not functions of the courts. These are not, you see, when I said earlier, when we started this program, I said there are three branches of government. There is the executive branch, there is the judicial branch, and there is the legislative branch. None of these should step into and take over the function of the other. The reasons why this and the, the executive took these decisions are not only there were issues of security. Since that money, this money redesign, you've seen that people um, uh, kidnapping and stopped, banditry had, had virtually stopped. Uh, Boko Haram was no more operational on, until, the, on, until the day of election. The last time they, they did was on the day of election, they were allegedly attacked people. The kidnappers had gone off kidnapping. The people who were attacking trains had gone off. Because they knew that there was no money. If you kidnap somebody, you just keep the, keep the person there. So, but you see, let me say this. The problem is the problem of the central bank. You see, when children are doing uh, uh, work, you see you, you, how they, they suffer. They All clean. right. What I did, uh, Barista I Mooring. Barista Mooring, we're going to take a break. Just hold your thoughts. We're going to take a break. We'll come back. After the news, we'll come back to continue with this. You're watching the run-up on Plus TV Africa. And I've had uh, Barista Imano Umoring. Uh, Barrister Johnson Ago and Adebayo Oloke discussing these issues with me. We'll take a break. We'll be back after the news to continue with our discussions. Stay with us. You're welcome back to the run up on Plus TV Africa. It's time to coast home. Uh, we still have 25 minutes to do that, though. I have Barrister Emmanuel Umaran, legal practitioner, as one of my host guests. I also have Barrister Johnson Ago with us. Not forgetting my co-host, who is joining us virtually, uh, Adebayo Oloake. Hello, gentlemen. Do I still have you all on? All right, Barisal Maren, before we took that break, 
Before we took that break, I had told you to hold your thoughts. Uh, let's continue from where you stopped. Okay. Um, so, uh, to recap a little before I get there, I was talking about how the Supreme Court arrived at um, um, John, uh, December 31st. That it's a policy, yes, the Supreme Court is a policy court. However, policies of the federal government, it is the executive that executes the policies of the federal government. And the reasoning for some of the policies of the federal government that is, uh, 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 I'd say that, that is executing uh, may not be reasons may not be within the the the, the, the not within the knowledge of the justice of the of the of the, of the, of the court or uh, of any court. Like now, the fact of the redesign of the naira had reduced and almost terminated kidnapping, uh, banditry. Uh, Boko Haram um, and um, other crimes, even uh, bribery, had been reduced tremendously because you nobody would ask you to transfer money to him because it, it would be traced and nobody had cash to give to anybody. Nobody would kidnap because if you kidnap the person, the person would end up, uh, you just have to kill the person. So there was no, nobody to, no, nobody had cash anywhere to give. All right, Adebayo, let, let Adebayo come in here. Adebayo, I'm sure you have a question to ask. Please do that. Yes, I do, Maureen. And um, I was wondering, actually, uh, based on discussions with a few compatriots as well, uh, on we know the Supreme Court has uh, the authority, you know, once cases are referred to it, to, to, to adjudicate on matters affecting us all, and it's the highest court in the land. But there were those who were wondering why in this particular case the focus wasn't on uh, requesting an order to get central bank to print more new notes and while the order was on the cba on, on the supreme court rather to authorize this continuous spending of the old notes and the reflection was around the fact that a lot of people do not have the old notes anymore and the complaint was that they don't have the new notes not that they wanted to keep spending the old notes. So what informed this kind of litigation and, and, and what could have been the benefit? I, I, I think maybe our, our colleagues, or uh, rather our guests, might be able to throw some light on that. Okay. Barrister Johnson, Agu, you want to answer that? <laughs> Actually, that's what I started with when I made my initial comment. I said that the logic does not follow. If the problem is scarcity of currency, the solution should be a directive to print more currency, especially of the extant design. The new design, if you have printed it in short supply, bring more to saturate the market and uh, reduce the scarcity. I do not see, or I, I would like someone to tell me what is very peculiar about the old versions of the notes which have been withdrawn. Is it that someone is keeping some somewhere and he wants an additional window to legitimately spend them? Okay. This, in my view, it is in my view, will be the very policy, the every um, evil, the policy of this redesign wants to call. So the Supreme Court's directive will be, uh, uh, let me say, defeating the very purpose for which the design uh, redesign was made, but. If the question or if the basis for Supreme Court's directive to um, um, circulate currency is to re reduce the scarcity, my thinking is that the best option is a directive asking CBN to quantify the design in the, I mean, the new currency in the market and, and supply as much as is necessary to meet the needs of the market. That's the way I see it. And that's actually how I started. So the concern that the people raised are, are very, very valid. Okay. And one uh, one okay. wonders why uh, um, um, such information is not in the public. I don't have it, so I'm not able to comment on facts. So I will also wonder, like those who have wondered, yeah. which your colleague has referred to. It does appear to me that we are um, going between, is it a case of the 
banks cannot or is it that the banks will not and that is given birth to because we've had so many policy somersaults and court injunctions that were not obeyed and so Nigerians have become very uncertain as to what to think at this point. However, uh, I add something, please? okay, go ahead. Yeah, please. I I have a very strong opinion that uh, the Supreme Court's decision, though it is decision of the Supreme Court, it stands. But I I am a very strong opinion that the Supreme Court decision was um, was without jurisdiction. The issue. All the people have been decided is the decision on, on the right of central bank was deliberately not added because then it the, the deprive the Supreme Court of, of, of its right, I mean, right to hear the case. If you take away the original of the Supreme Court, if central bank was added, now the fact that it was not added and decisions were made against it is a breach of its fundamental rights. It affects the jurisdiction of. of Supreme Court to go on into that matter. That's one. Two is this: the system. The system we've seen the system for several years running very poorly. Children who want to do work, you see the way they, they suffer. Children want to do jam, you see the way they suffer. See the way Nigerians suffer to get PVC. See the way Nigerians suffer to get um, a, a vein. Uh, uh, see the way Nigerians suffer to get. Um, um, uh, the vaccination. See the way Nigerians suffer to get uh, uh, what you call it, this uh, bank uh, identification num uh, number that they gave us. We to get everything in Nigeria is run poorly. This is what has affected us. Why did the central bank not know that direct all banks that every bank every money that is coming that we are going to supply must come out of the ATMs. Why that any bank that the, any cobo any naira that is is required that call that is not paid through the ATMs would affect the license of the bank? I ask so, uh, uh, my, uh, my sister, which state in Nigeria will a governor call a branch manager and tell him, "Oh, you have fifty million. Let me have forty million," and the branch manager will say, "No." Well, at this Let point, me, let me ask you. Let me ask you of your assessment of the CBN governor generally. Omarin, what's your assessment of the CBN governor, Emir Fene? It's unfortunate. How did uh, the CBN governor take leave, 30 days leave, in the process of this major decision? He's, he's a 61-year-old man. He was there in 1984 when, when um, the RNC was changed also, and he saw the mess it was made of. So why would he leave the country and take his annual leave for 30 days? They, they, are, they all because of problems. If he had supervised properly, he was sitting in Nigeria, he had, before this policy was, was pronounced, he had taken, asked all the chairmen of banks and, and their uh, managing directors to meet with him and the president. And the president had read right out to them that, look, any cover of this matter that doesn't come out of the ATMs, you, know, you will hear from me and, and the security agencies, and your license will be on, on the line. I tell you, None of those banks would, would do what they are doing. The fact was that the monies were not allowed to, to be spread to, uh, to be paid to Nigerians. If the monies were paid to ATMs, you would have seen. All right. The uh, uh, would have been there. All right. The, the time will not permit us to go f uh, further than this. But before we go, uh, Barrister Agu, briefly, briefly give us your assessment of the CBN governor, Godwin Omiafele. <laughs> okay, um, he's a public servant, and um, he appears not to um, know the full extent of his powers and his limits. So, uh, in some instances, you've seen him doubling into areas that are supposedly fiscal policy, not monetary policy. There's a difference between fiscal policy and monetary policy, but some of the things he does fall into the remit of fiscal policy. Uh, uh, um, um, regarding the monetary policy, he hasn't done perfectly. That's exactly why we have this, um, uh, the exchange rate problems, the multiple exchange regime, and all of those. 
Now, maybe I shouldn't blame him for doubling into the fiscal policy regime. Probably be, if the government of the day and the Minister of Finance uh, and the economic team of the existing regime were doing their job properly, there will be no room for the CBN governor to uh, usurp the fiscal policy making obligations and duties. So in my view, the CBN governor most probably is trying to cover up a lapse and in so doing, he has taken more than is within his uh, legal remit and more than he himself can chew. That's my honest uh, assessment of him. Or maybe because I don't have all the facts, but the much I can see, this is the much I can say. Maybe if he's given an opportunity to explain away some of the reasons why we've come to these conclusions, our assessment might change. You know, it's not always fair to judge a person when you've not had him. Yeah, and finally, Barry Mora, you know, you did say that it would appear that the whole essence for all of this policy has been defeated. We, the forthcoming election uh, on the 18th, um, the Human and Environmental Development Agenda, uh, that's a group, have uh, called on the EFCC and the CBN to investigate illicit fund transactions by corrupt politicians and vote buying. How do you respond to that? Yes, I, I think, you see, these are, you see, I don't understand why the FCC will wait for petitions. I don't know. I hope we have other agencies like that all over the world. Why would we wait for petitions? When people are breaking the law, you see them. Why do you have to wait for petitions? And, you know, I've said, said this, since 2003, when the FCC, um, I mean, uh, 2003, yes, when the FCC, the act, I was, I was part, in 2007 when the act was passed. You see, the FCC is a major problem in our country. I, I'll give you an example. Now, in 2007, yeah. uh, patient Jonathan was arrested for money laundering in, in River State. And um, she was to be prosecuted. I asked the FCC on national television, why have you not joined the bank that aided patient Jonathan in, in money laundering? That case has died. But what you are able to prosecute properly, what you are supposed to do, you are doing it. You will achieve the objective of, your, of, of the law that created you. You do not pursue the little fries and leave the big, uh, the, the, the big fishes. Mm. It's the big fishes that create the problems. Until you get them, the young the small fries will not look at you and see that you are serious. Yeah, well, this is a good place this to stop this discussion. You. Yeah, Baris Omara, I will not allow us to continue, but I love these conversations that we've been having today. Barrister Umano Umarin, a legal practitioner, and Barrister Johnson Agu have joined Adebayo Alooke and I today to take a look at very uh, serious issues of the NARA redesign policy and the court order that INEC has been given to allow the use of temporary voter cards in the March 18 election. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Thank you. I am Maureen Menongwe. Many thanks for watching. Good afternoon.